Okay, welcome back to effective field theory. We have discussed the method of regions, which is a tool to expand loop integrals and which provides the basis for the validity of effective field theories and gives us the practical way how we can calculate uh, the effective field theory matching um, if we want to match to a fundamental theory including loop corrections. I gave you already one um, reformulation of the method of regions via the path integral, which provides an intuitive picture why it works and where the structure comes from. Even though the path integral doesn't technically give you exactly the same recipe using dimensional regularization, but an intuitive background. But today I will show you a final reformulation which is exactly identical to the method of regions for the case we consider, which is called large mass expansion. It is equivalent to the method of regions for the case we are considering, namely where we have a set of small momenta and small masses and a set of large masses and the ratio of these go to zero. And uh, in this particular case, the large mass expansion is exactly the same as the method of regions, but um, I, it was historically developed first before the method of regions was invented and therefore it has a separate name and it exists for a longer period of time and you can find papers on it with explicit proofs, full all order proofs uh, which make no reference to the method of regions because method of regions was invented at the end of the 1990s. And, uh, the method of regions was of course invented because it is ultimately more general since the uh, approach where you simply identify regions of uh, loop momenta can be applied not only in this case but also in other cases where other ratios go to zero or infinity. But uh, since it is identical, uh, you might wonder why I should teach it to you. And the reason is the language is a little bit different and it is actually useful to think about all these uh, tools using different languages and so because uh, thinking it uh, allows you to think in different ways and therefore to apply it with more confidence. And uh, the relationship between uh, this approach and uh, the effective field theories may be even a little bit more direct and you can more directly see how the different ingredients of the expansion map to vertices or loop diagrams in an effective theory. So let me give you the statement. So we uh, define Fg, an amplitude for a Feynman graph, capital G. So uh, we uh, then consider this amplitude for the Feynman diagram in this particular case where we have a set of large masses. We divide them by a scaling factor rho, small momenta and small masses and we consider the limit where rho goes to zero. So in this way of scaling, um, the large masses go to infinity basically and that is the limit that we want to consider. And uh, then the statement is that uh, this can be expanded as follows. Namely, we take a sum over so-called subgraphs G and I will explain what these subgraphs are. And uh, for each subgraph, we uh, get the following expression, namely amplitude f for a subgraph or for a graph g divided by small g times Taylor expansion with respect to the subgraph g of the amplitude for the subgraph g plus a remainder. And uh, 
This is the expansion. So before, uh, before going into details, you see that there is a similarity to the method of regions. Namely, you do Taylor expansions of parts of the diagram. This is basically what it says. Like in the method of regions, different Taylor expansions of different parts of the diagram need to be added up in order to get a correct expansion of the full diagram. And uh, which Taylor expansions of which subgraphs and what do the symbols mean, I will explain in a second. And then you will also see the equivalence to the method of regions. So, and the statement is that if uh, we Taylor expand up to some order rho to the n, then the remainder here is uh, smaller than rho to the power n plus one plus some small parameter delta where delta is bigger than zero but small. Uh, so the plus delta basically means that in principle you have a behavior uh, smaller than rho to the n plus one, but maybe there are also logarithm of rho factors in the result and uh, they are suppressed by the plus delta here in the exponent. So basically it behaves like uh, the next power up to logarithms. So that is the statement. And let me now explain what the subgraphs are. So the subgraphs G run over all subgraphs which have the following properties. On the one hand, they contain all heavy lines. All of them. And second, they are one particle irreducible with respect to the light lines. And they may be disconnected. But each connected part is then one particle irreducible with respect to the light lines. So, and please note that this directly corresponds to uh, our path integral um, derivation, where we had this WH of LS action, and we uh, analyzed which Feynman diagrams contribute to this WH action, which is the action of the EFT, and it was exactly such diagrams. In particular, we also derived this property that they must be one particle irreducible with respect to the light lines. And so this is reflected by this formula. So we sum over all subgraphs. Then what do we do for each subgraph? So this operation here, Tg of Fg, the second factor, um, corresponds to the amplitude of the subgraph um, Taylor expanded with respect to its external momenta and the small masses. Okay. So this is interesting because a subgraph in general contains um, as incoming lines loop momenta. And uh, then we would treat here the loop momenta which flow into the subgraph as small because we Taylor expand in the external momenta of the subgraph which can be a loop momentum. So this is then a case where we treat a particular loop momentum as small in the method of regions namely the ones which come into this particular subdiagram. What happens if after we do this, so we take some subgraph, we tailor expand it with respect to x external momenta. After doing it, uh, of course, we get a polynomial in the external momenta of this subgraph. A polynomial in the external momenta is automatically a Feynman rule corresponding to a local EFT Lagrangian. 
So this gives directly a Feynman rule of an EFT. So this gives rise to an EFT vertex. So this is the second factor. We basically replace a subgraph by its Taylor expansion, which makes it a vertex corresponding to an effective field theory. And then the remaining factor here, f of g divided by g, that corresponds to the full diagram where we replace the subgraph g by exactly this expression here. is shrunk to a point where T, G, F, G is inserted. And therefore, the full construction has exactly the form of an EFT Feynman diagram. Namely, this is a local EFT vertex which gets inserted into a bigger maybe loop diagram, and therefore we have here a loop diagram in an EFT with new EFT Feynman rules. And uh, can this part of the diagram here, can it contain any heavy line? No, it cannot, because the subgraphs must contain all heavy lines. Therefore, these are only diagrams with light lines, and that is exactly what we need for an EFT Feynman diagram. So, um, has the form of an EFT diagram. Okay, and let me just in one line give you one minimal example. For example, the one loop example that we always had. This one here. What do we get? We have one uh, full theory diagram with one heavy and one light line. And what does this procedure tell us? We should sum over all subdiagrams which contain all heavy lines and which are one particle irreducible with respect to the light lines. Here, there are two such subdiagrams. What are the two subdiagrams? So, uh, who sees one possibility? the diagram itself. The diagram itself is one particle irreducible with respect to the light lines, and it contains all heavy lines. Therefore, one term in the sum is where G is the full diagram. And then we would simply get the Taylor expansion of the full diagram. Okay. And the Taylor expansion now means I do not write, uh, maybe let me write the symbols. The Taylor expansion means Taylor expansion with respect to its external momenta, which is the outer momentum P, and the small mass in the loop. And we know that the Taylor expansion always commutes with a loop integration, so we could pull the Taylor expansion also inside the loop integral, and then we see that this is the same as in the method of regions where we took the loop momentum as big and we do a Taylor expansion with respect to this. So that would be the hard region in uh, the method of regions. And the result is automatically a polynomial in the light momentum and the light mass, which corresponds to a three-level EFT diagram. It has this form in the EFT. Now, the second subdiagram is, of course, just the heavy line itself. The heavy line itself is also uh, one particle irreducible with respect to the light lines because there is no light line. And so we would say we take first, let's go from the right, Taylor expansion of just the heavy line. The heavy line has four external lines. And uh, in particular here, there is a loop momentum incoming. Here, there is the momentum P incoming. 
and here this is heavy. And we do a Taylor expansion, we have the loop momentum and the small, um, so there is no small mass, but uh, basically there is only the loop momentum and the external momentum, we treat them as small as the, and the heavy mass as heavy. So that uh, would correspond in the, okay, so method of region soft, but let's first put it into the full diagram. So here in the full diagram, the heavy line is now shrunk to a point, and then the diagram looks like this. And this blob here is replaced by the Taylor expansion of that. So in this two-step procedure, here this becomes a Feynman rule in an EFT for a four-point vertex with four light lines. And uh, this gets inserted into this. So we see a direct correspondence to an EFT Feynman diagram, namely this one. And in the method of regions, this is of course the soft region. So that's it. And uh, I do not prove the equivalence in general. It's fairly easy to see that method of regions for this particular mass ratios and uh, large mass expansion always are exactly the same uh, algorithms, just viewed in a slightly different way. And uh, so therefore, I think this is a sufficient example for this case. And sometimes it is nicer to think about the expansion in terms of the sub-diagrams, uh, which really directly give you also the Feynman rules of the EFT very nicely. Okay, any questions to this? Um, because if not, then we can come to the next topic. Ah, but here is a question, very is nice. Is there a possibility to construct a case where there is a variable uh, that uh, can be, has different regions in the method of regions, but in this case uh, doesn't uh, appear? Like a um, loop momentum or a uh, mass? Or? Uh, that is really impossible, and um, uh, the simple reason is that we are looking only at these simple uh, mass ratios where there are precisely two hierarchies or two, um, uh, yeah, two regions or two, let's say, uh, scales, heavy scales and light scales and nothing in between. And because of that, uh, the method of regions always has a binary decision. Either any variable is heavy or light, there is n nothing else. And then uh, going through all the different combinations of uh, distributions of loop momenta into heavy or light, um, it automatically gives rise to the same kind of Taylor expansions of sub-diagrams as here. Okay, let us um, stop with a general theory of the expansions at this point. And let us now come to a really important and interesting physics application. One interesting way how uh, the method of regions um, played a role in recent discussions also here in the group, but also elsewhere, uh, is in the application to G minus two of the muon. G minus two is of course one of the most um, interesting low energy observables in elementary particle physics, one of the most precisely measured quantities in particle physics and also uh, extremely well calculated in the standard model up to 10 digits, and uh, there is an almost agreement between standard model theory and experiment, even though uh, there is a slight discrepancy, which is, however, a little bit under debate. And uh, in order to get agreement between standard model and experiment, you really need all contributions um, of the standard model, all particles that we know matter, all interactions that we know also matter um, uh, numerically, and uh, we uh, will now look at a case where there is exactly such a hierarchy of scales, namely the electroweak contributions to G minus two, where the muon is of course a light particle and also the 
energies in G minus 2 are small, the muon is basically at rest. But uh, we have heavy particles like the Higgs and the Z and W in the loop. And therefore, that is a prime example where such approximations could play a role. And we will analyze how we can use the method of regions to simplify the calculation. And not only that, to give us really an understanding of which contributions exist and what kind of orders um, in the result can appear. Um, let us have a look at the exercise sheet. Um, in the exercise sheet, you have exactly this task. You should, um, maybe I will also get one. Um, so you should um, look at three diagrams for G minus two, namely uh, with the W boson, Z boson, and Higgs boson loop. These are the three heavy bosons in the standard model. And um, the question is, in each case, what is the order of the contribution? Um, and uh, with, uh, with experience, of course, you know what kind of powers of the large or small masses could appear in the result. Uh, but at first, you might wonder, does this diagram contribute at a level 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 10, or 10 to the minus 15 to g minus 2 of the muon? And uh, this is what we are going to find out. And uh, you can use the method of regions to um, uh, figure out all these different terms. And you see in the equations that I put onto the exercise sheet, there are various examples of uh, types of contributions which can in principle appear. So the first example would be gauge coupling square divided by 16 pi square times a mass ratio muon mass square divided by heavy mass square. So this is the most naive kind of contribution. But there could also be a logarithm in the result because we have seen many loops give rise to logarithms. If there is a logarithm of a mass ratio like mw over mu1, this is a huge enhancement factor. And um, so you can ask the question for all the three diagrams. And um, uh, the exercise tells you to do it for the w first. In the lecture, we will do it for the Higgs and the Z. And you can do in parallel the exercise. And for the W, you can, you can do it alone. And actually, as it is claimed on the sheet, you do not need to do any calculation. But you need, to, of course, to do the analysis of the large mass expansion. And uh, afterwards, you can look at the diagrams. And just by looking at them, you can see what is the result without doing the calculation. OK, so let us first get started. Let's look at the full diagrams. And uh, first, one brief statement on mu1 g minus 2. Um, this is the magnetic dipole moment. Which can be written as mu vector is equal to a gyro magnetic ratio g times the spin vector times E over 2 times the muon mass in this case. And the gyromagnetic ratio is a dimensionless ratio. And in classical electrodynamics, uh, the magnetic dipole moment of a spinning ball, which is uniformly charged, is always exactly 1. That is where the definition comes from. On the other hand, given the Dirac equation for a spin 1 half fermion, g would be exactly equal to 2. But uh, in reality, it's neither 1 nor 2, but something else. And so we define g mu is equal to 2 times 1 plus a mu. And a mu is called the anomaly of the magnetic dipole moment. So it's the deviation from 2, appropriately normalized. And then the current results are as follows. The experimental result for this AMU is the following number, 116592059 plus minus 22 times 10 to the minus 11. So you see this is a 10 to the minus 11 measurement with an uncertainty at the 10 to the minus 10 level. Um, and therefore, um, all these digits here are known. 
Then from the standard model, we have the following prediction, 116591810 plus minus 43 times 10 to the minus 11. So you see that it's very similar, but here there is a difference. And the difference is here at the level of uh, 200 uh, with the uncertainty of this 22 and 43. So it's a non-negligible difference. Um, however, the problem is uh, there are some recent discrepancies in the standard model prediction and so it has been challenged by uh, more recent results which are however partial results and so this is under debate. Let's just say it is under debate and progress is, is expected. Once uh, there is a confirmed new result, uh, it is actually, I would say, likely that the discrepancy will shrink. But anyway, uh, just to give us some feeling for the situation, the current difference is 24.9 plus minus 4.8 times 10 to the minus 10. So this is the level of discrepancy and also the level of the uncertainty. And so what it means in theory, we should uh, aim for a precision at a level 10 to the minus 10. All contributions of any kind of standard model physics or new physics which matter at a level 10 to the minus 10 must be taken into account. Um, and uh, maybe there is even some new physics um, showing up here in, in terms of this discrepancy. So that could be new Higgs bosons, supersymmetric particles, or dark matter particles, or something like this. But um, going through it, uh, the standard model prediction, you show that uh, all particles and all interactions matter from the lightest to the heaviest particles. So it tests all aspects of the standard model and precise calculations are needed, for example, electroweak effects uh, are necessary at the two-loop level. Okay, now coming back to your exercise sheet, if you look at the numbers, uh, can you work out in uh, 30 seconds what is the result of this first example? g square over 16 pi square times the muon mass square divided by mw square. g square is the gauge coupling square and you know that uh, g square over 4 pi is roughly alpha over uh, alpha. Alpha is 1 over 136, 37. So it's basically 10 to the minus 2. Well, g square over 16 pi square is then 10 to the minus 3 and so on. So what is the overall result? 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, something like that. But here divided by MW is something like 1 divided by 400. Uh, I think the muon mass is 0.1 GeV, the W is 80 GeV. So let's say approximately 100 GeV. Then the ratio is 1,000. And then 1,000 square. No, it's 100, 100, yeah, 100, yeah, yeah, right. So the coupling uh, square is 10 to the minus 3. The mass ratio is 10 to the minus 6. So it would be 10 to the minus 9. Therefore, you expect from one loop electroweak effects 10 to the minus 9, which is relevant. But if there is such a logarithmic enhancement, it would be maybe 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 7. And if there is some suppression, it might be less than 10 to the minus 9. But you see that uh, one loop electroweak is exactly of a very interesting order. And it is very important to know whether there are such logarithmic enhancements or not. And that is what we are studying now. Let me clean the blackboard first. This will take a while.
So we will now do the full calculation, actually the full calculation of the diagrams with the Z and the Higgs. And uh, we will apply the method of regions, but we have in particular in mind answering the question, are there logarithmic enhancements and what is the leading non-vanishing term? On the exercise sheet, I gave you this example with uh, mass suppression, muon mass square divided by heavy mass square. Okay, uh, but you might wonder, is this obvious? Maybe there is also a result uh, which does not contain this suppression factor, which would be of the order mass ratio to the zeroth power. Uh, then the result would be six orders of magnitude bigger. Okay, so that would also be important to know. Or maybe uh, the leading term with one mass ratio doesn't exist and it starts with mass ratio square. Then the contribution would be 10 to the minus 15. And if there is a logarithm, then we have a significant enhancement. So this is what we will in particular have a look at, but as a byproduct, we will get the full result. So the description of G minus two is in terms of such Feynman diagrams. You start with a muon with incoming momentum P then an outgoing muon with momentum P prime, a photon with incoming momentum Q. And uh, if you calculate Feynman diagrams with these external lines, then you get a result of the form minus I EQ times a spinor U bar of P prime times something times a spinor U of P. Uh, for the two muons in the initial and the final state, and in between you have gamma mu and gamma five terms, which are not important for us, plus a term fm of q square times p plus p prime mu. Okay, so here is the external Lorentz index mu. We do not put a wave function for the photon but just keep an external open index. Then uh, so we need to identify the term which goes with the two momenta and an open index without any gamma matrix. And uh, this will get a prefactor which only depends on Q square. Where P square is equal to P prime square is equal to the muon mass square. And then uh, the anomaly A mu is equal to minus two times the muon mass times Fm at zero. That is the result. And of course, I will not prove this here. This would be a different lecture. And in a renormalizable quantum field theory, like the standard model, this Fm of zero is finite. And we will see this also in our results. The Feynman diagrams, uh, when we extract Fm, will automatically be finite and we can rely on this. Okay, so now the interesting diagrams for the electroweak standard model. are of course this diagram here with a set where a muon is in the loop and uh, the set forms the loop. Similarly, a Higgs and a muon in the loop or um, W boson and neutrino and the photon can couple to the W boson because that has electric charge. And also in usual gauges like arc psi gauge, there are diagrams like this, neutrino and here W boson and here the charged Goldstone boson G plus minus, which is unphysical, but in uh, arc psi gauge, um, this is not gauged away and therefore there are also such diagrams with a mixed vertex photon W and Goldstone boson. So these are the four diagrams and uh, 
this is what you should look at on the exercise sheet and discuss it using the method of regions or large mass expansion. And uh, these we will do in the lecture and also the exercises. So the questions are, what is the leading non-vanishing order? So they will, the interesting mass ratio is the ratio of the muon mass divided by these heavy masses and we will do an expansion and uh, in general there is automatically such a, a function of these mass ratios and the question is what is the leading non-vanishing order? What is the exponent by which this uh, mass ratio appears? I gave you some hints on the exercise sheet but I mean it's a question. And the other question is whether there is a log enhancement proportional to the log of some heavy masses divided by the light mass or whether such a log enhancement is not present. One thing is clear. Namely, in many loop diagrams, there is an ln mu square present and uh, you should already know um, with which coefficient the ln mu square appears in these g minus two contributions from the diagrams. How does ln mu square appear? What is the coefficient of ln mu square? One. One. In which units? It should not. Um, why did you think it should have prefactor one? Because it looks like a B zero function, or is this the reason? Uh, I mean, for example, indeed, this so-called B zero function has a prefactor one over epsilon times one. That is the B zero function. But here we have some complicated Feynman diagrams with coupling constants and so on. So they also. Uh, yeah are proportional to these vertex factors. And so the prefactor cannot be one for sure not. But uh, I told you just a minute ago that the result is finite. Therefore, the coefficient of epsilon, one over epsilon is zero. There is no one over epsilon. And therefore, there is no ln mu square. So the diagrams are finite, therefore there is no ln mu square. And that means, um, unfortunately, we cannot use this ln mu square to give us some information on the physical logs. Very often we can simply look at the ln mu square dependence and then, as you say, that must be accompanied by a log of a physical scale. And, but the ln mu square is easy to determine and then uh, we can conclude something on the logs of physical scales. But in this case, that doesn't exist, but nothing can stop the diagram from producing such a log in principle. That is really possible. And therefore, that is interesting to figure out. And in order to figure it out, we uh, can use the method of regions because it disentangles heavy and light scales. And then after we have disentangled the heavy and light scales, each log of each physical scale can only come in combination with a suitable ln mu square. That is the trick. So, anyway, let us now 
embark on the calculation. And the way we will do it is uh, kind of by a mix of lecture and exercises. Um, I have now given you the exercise sheet and uh, today I will probably give you some highlights in the lecture um, with um, a few intermediate results. But I think I'm trying to sketch the full result un until the end. And uh, we will do as, uh, as few um, intermediate results as are necessary such that we finish on time. And then we can fill in the intermediate steps um, in the exercise. So, um, I structure it as follows. First, let's do amplitude preparation. So that is not yet dry enough. Mm, okay, so maybe let's do it here. So first for the Higgs. For the Higgs specifically, uh, we are now precise about the Feynman diagram. Incoming momentum P, outgoing momentum P prime, here incoming momentum Q. And then in the loop, we have an assignment as follows. Here, the loop momentum K runs backwards. Then here, we have the loop momentum K plus P prime running forwards. And here, we have the loop momentum K plus P running in the loop. Then we have only positive signs, which is a little bit nicer. Then this diagram has the following amplitude. Of course, we have an integral over the loop momentum k. And otherwise, we have here two coupling constants of vertices where a Higgs couples to a muon. And for the purpose of this, let us just say this coupling is minus i times y, where y is the Yukawa coupling for the muon. And let's not uh, discuss in detail what is the value of this Yukawa coupling. Anyway, uh, then we have minus IY squared from the two uh, Yukawa vertices. And then we have a fraction which contains the propagators and the gamma matrices from the other vertices. So at first we have this propagator here, propagator for uh, this fermion with the momentum K plus P prime. So the numerator is I times K slash plus P prime slash plus m, and in the denominator we have k plus p prime square minus m square. That is the first propagator. Then we have the vertex here with the photon and the muon, and this has the Feynman rule minus i e q gamma mu with the open Lorentz index mu corresponding to the external photon. Then we have the Feynman rule for this propagator over there, which is again a Dirac propagator with numerator k slash plus p slash plus m. And in the denominator we have k plus p square minus m square. So the same but with p instead of p prime. And then we have the Higgs propagator, which has numerator i divided by k square minus the Higgs mass square. Okay, so that's it. And now let's uh, amplitude preparation. So that means let us simplify it a little bit before we really uh, do the actual loop calculation. So let's pull out all the prefactors which we can pull out. Then we have two powers of the Yukawa coupling. We have EQ from the um, muon charge, and we have how many factors of I? Minus I square times I times uh, another minus I gives minus one times I square gives plus one, so plus. Then we have the integral, and in the numerator we have then the following. Um, let's also note that uh, we take the whole thing between the spinors u bar of p prime and u of p. So we do not write them 
but let's always keep in mind that they are there. So if on the left there is u bar of p prime, what happens to this factor? u bar of p prime does something to the p prime slash because of the Dirac equation. The spinora satisfies the Dirac equation. We are p prime slash plus m gives zero uh, or minus. So p prime slash can be replaced by the mass m, right? Because of the Dirac equation. And also here, p slash acts on u of p p slash u is equal to m times u. So this can be replaced by m. That can be replaced by m as well. So we have k slash plus 2m. And also on the right, and then in the middle, gamma mu times another k slash plus 2m. Okay. And in the denominator, we actually have the following k square plus 2kp, if we expand it, k square plus 2kp plus p square minus m square, but p square minus m square is zero. So we just have k square plus 2kp prime. And then in the other denominator, k square plus 2kp. And then k square minus mh square. So this is now a little bit simplified. And let us, uh, as an intermediate step, apply some rearrangement of the numerator. So the numerator can be written as follows. So we have k slash gamma mu k slash plus 2m times anti-commutator k slash with gamma mu plus 4m square times gamma mu. Okay. Why the anti-commutator? Because the two m terms, they come once with k slash gamma mu and once with gamma mu times k slash gives in total the anti-commutator. So then uh, we can rearrange it. First of all, this term here, um, can be neglected. So this is a term directly proportional to gamma mu, and uh, no matter what the integral does with it, uh, the integral can only change the prefactor, but in the end that will be something proportional to gamma mu. And to g minus two, the gamma mu terms do not contribute. Therefore, we can neglect it. So whenever we know that even after the integral something remains just gamma mu, we we'll throw it away. But of course, for example, here there is gamma mu, but uh, there is also k slash, and therefore the integral will do something to the gamma mu, so we cannot throw away this one. Um, but instead, this will become two times k mu, and uh, then integrating might give something proportional to p mu or p prime mu, so that can contribute. And here, so let's rearrange this as well by using the anti-commutator. So we can write this as, first of all, minus gamma mu k slash k slash plus 2 k mu k slash. Okay, that is the same as this one by using the anti-commutator between the first two. k slash gamma mu is equal to minus gamma mu k slash plus 2 times the anti-commutator, which is um, k mu. And then k slash square is equal to k square the number and then we have again something proportional to gamma mu, which will remain gamma mu even after the integral. Therefore, we can also neglect this. And then we have here this plus 4m k mu. And therefore, our numerator simply becomes 2k mu k slash plus 4m k mu. So this is the numerator. And so therefore our result is equal to y square eq times the integral 2k mu k slash plus 4m k mu divided by the three denominators. 
So that is the result. <coughs> this is the result for our Higgs loop diagram. And let us also say something on the Z. So for the Z to get started, um, let's say this vertex here is now, uh, do you have any question to the Higgs, first of all? Can you do this yourself as well? Uh, the same for the Z. So for the Z, let us now start. And here we simply say this vertex is minus I gamma mu times some combination CV minus gamma 5 CA here and also there. So the, that is the structure of the Z vertex. And we could look up what are the actual numbers CV and CA. But these are numbers uh, proportional to gauge couplings. And there is a term with gamma mu and another one with gamma mu gamma 5. OK, then let's do the same for the Z. And uh, then we have here the following, minus i gamma mu cv minus ca gamma 5. And then we have basically the same structure as here, i times k slash plus p prime slash plus m minus i eq gamma mu i k slash plus p slash plus m. Then another minus i gamma, uh, sorry, and here that is not mu, but some other index rho. And then here, rho downstairs times CV minus CA gamma 5. And then the Z boson propagator, let's use psi equal 1 gauge. Then the numerator is just minus I, minus I instead of plus I. And the denominators are the same as before except that uh, maybe here you would have the Z mass instead of the Higgs mass, but otherwise the structure is uh, identical. Yep. No, we cannot square it because now the gamma matrices do not commute. So one factor is here and the other factor is here. And they are contracted, the gamma mu's are contracted, so there is gamma rho with downstairs index, gamma rho with upstairs index, they are contracted because of the Z boson propagator, which has a metric tensor in the numerator. And now, um, first of all, we cannot simply square the couplings of the Z because they do not commute. And second, we also cannot use the Dirac equation. P slash prime cannot be set to M because the spinor is here, and in between the spinor and the p slash prime, there is something with gamma matrices. So therefore, we cannot immediately apply the Dirac equation. So, but uh, one can now do a few steps, and that is maybe an exercise. Um, but after some steps, you can arrive at the following, namely, uh, let's say the numerator has uh, CV square terms, CV square terms. They are given by K mu K slash times four minus two D minus four K slash P plus P prime mu. And let me also write the CA square terms. So that is the same. That is the same. And then here um, we have zero. And here we have minus eight M P plus P prime mu. Then we have here plus four M K mu, and here we have plus 4 minus 4d mk mu. And 
and then there are CA, CV terms are proportional to gamma 5 and can be neglected. So we only need the CV square and the CA square terms and these are the results after a long winded calculation. The strategy of the calculation would be as follows. I would say first look only at uh, these leftmost factors. Try to bring this as much as possible to the very left such that you can use the Dirac equation and then simplify as much as possible just the combination of these two. Do the same here on the right. These two factors here bring this to the very left by using anti-commutation relations, apply the Dirac equation and simplify as much as possible and afterwards try to deal with a, a full structure. And always throw away just gamma mu terms, throw away gamma 5 terms and this is what remains. So in the end we have now a collection of integrals I, let's say general, the general integrals that we now encounter are the following. In the denominator we have k square plus 2kp prime times k square plus 2kp times k square minus a heavy mass square. Okay, so the denominator has never changed. This is the denominator in both cases of both Feynman diagrams. And uh, now in the numerator we can now collect what we have seen. We see here a term k mu k slash. That term appears here as well with a more complicated prefactor. So we should be able to calculate integrals with k mu k slash. Comma. And uh, so let's just write down all numerator structures. Then we have k mu just as a factor in the integral. So we should also be able to calculate k mu. Here there appears k slash which is basically the same. So we should calculate this once and for all. Here there is also k mu. Here there is also k mu. And here there is a constant with no k dependence in the numerator. So we should also be able to calculate the thing with a one in the numerator. And yep. which mass is this? You must know the Yeah, uh, either mass, either the set or the Higgs. But this is the common structure of both integrals. So this is now kind of a master integral which we need to know in order to evaluate both diagrams. So this kind of integral structure with the Higgs or Z mass appears in both cases. And so we should now in general calculate such, uh, such integrals. And then we can use the result for the Higgs and we can also use the result for the Z. Why not write it down where m can be m higgs or m z and these diagrams here with a higgs or with a z contain different linear combinations of these master integral. Okay, so we have prepared our Feynman diagrams and now we want to calculate them and in principle we could calculate them exactly, of course, but we will apply the method of regions which is probably a little bit simpler indeed and gives us a practice for the effective field theory point of view and which also gives us insight on where logarithms appear and where they don't appear and why. So let us begin to apply the method of regions and let us begin with the soft part. So uh, clearly 
there are again two regions, uh, the soft region con is the one where the loop momentum in the diagrams is proportional or of the order of the muon mass or if the external momenta. And the hard region is the one where the loop momentum is of the order of the heavy mass, Higgs or Z mass. So this gives us exactly two regions and let us now look only at the soft region. So if we apply it to such a diagram with Higgs or similarly for the Z, then the soft region means that the loop momentum is small. If the loop momentum is small, it means that uh, in this part of the diagram, the heavy line, the Higgs line, is approximated because here we have one over K square minus the heavy mass square. The loop momentum K is small, so this becomes essentially just one over the Higgs mass square. And K square can be neglected to zero in first approximation in the loop. So that means that uh, in the large mass expansion, we would take this subdiagram, just the heavy line, shrink it to a point, Taylor expand it and insert it into the light remaining diagram. So we get this structure here, where the blob is given by the Taylor expansion of just the heavy line with respect to K and M in general, but it doesn't depend on M, so it's just a Taylor expansion in K. So what happens, uh, simply put, is that one over K square minus M square becomes just one over minus M square. And higher order terms would be of the order one over M to the fourth, and let us not go to this order. One over M square is small enough. So here the leading non-vanishing term is already mass suppressed. That is maybe not completely obvious from the beginning. And indeed, in the hard part, uh, there would be the potential for terms which are of the order m to the zero. But here there is no potential for terms of the order m to the zero. Every term is at least one over mass square suppressed. Leading non vanishing term already proportional to 1 over m square. Now, that could be an exercise for you um, to calculate this. Mm, but I would say, let us do this together as an example. So I will calculate this um, now fully. And uh, then maybe in the exercise you can do uh, other parts yourself. So let us evaluate the resulting integral. Okay, what we have to do now is to um, go to our expression the full expression of the diagram, apply this procedure. That means in the integrals on the top blackboard, we replace the heavy propagator by just minus one over m square. And then we do the integral. That is the method of regions soft part. So since we uh, want to be a general and we do not only want the Higgs, we will do it for this general uh, that I called I general. So we take these three kinds of integrals, and for each one we apply the soft method of regions, which means we calculate all three where we have here just minus one over m square. That's what we do. Then we have three results, and we can use the results to evaluate the soft region for the Higgs and the soft region for the Z. Okay. We will maybe only do it for the Higgs here, but we will now calculate these three general integrals uh, using the method of regions and the soft part. For the evaluation, I will tell you 
uh, the trick um, that I would use. It is maybe not the most obvious trick, but uh, let me simply tell it to you. It's a suggestion. Of course, you can do it also differently, but I would apply a substitution. Um, of course, this is maybe uh, not the first substitution that I tried, but it's the best one. K goes to K minus P plus P prime over two. So the average. That means that K plus P, which often appears, K plus P goes to K plus P over two minus P prime over two, which is K minus Q over two, where Q is the photon momentum. And K plus P prime goes to K plus Q over two. So the two denominators here become symmetric. So we have basically symmetrized and one denominator has uh, K uh, minus Q square and the other one has K plus Q square. Then uh, with this substitution, our general integral with the uh, commas in the uh, numerator is the following. It becomes k mu k slash comma k mu comma one and in the denominator we have at first k plus p prime square minus m square k plus p square minus m square so I write it down once more times minus 1 over m square without k dependence. And uh, now we do the substitution. Let's do the substitution first in the denominator. In the denominator we get here k plus q over 2 square minus m square. Here we get k minus q over 2 square minus m square, so the denominator is symmetric under k goes to minus k, which is uh, interesting, times minus 1 over m square. And in the numerator, of course, we also have to use the substitution. And then we have here k um, minus p plus p prime over 2 with Lorentz index mu times k slash minus p slash plus p prime slash over two. So that is the first numerator. Looks very horrible, but it's actually quite um, um, easy to deal with. Then k mu becomes k minus p plus p prime over two mu. And the one, of course, remains one. Maybe use also, let me use this blackboard here because it is drier. So now, um, one thing that is good about our substitution is that the denominator is symmetric in k and uh, minus k. Therefore, odd terms in k vanish. Okay, they vanish because uh, um, an integral which is uh, odd in k uh, automatically vanishes since we integrate over all of k. That means many terms in the numerator now vanish. In particular here, this horrible looking uh, product of four terms, of course two of them are odd, they vanish and the even terms survive. So therefore uh, the first becomes now the following. So the denominator is always the same, but in the numerator we have now k mu k slash, simply. And then the thing with the p's, but what happens here with p slash and p prime slash, this is now really on the left of the integral, uh, so there is no other gamma matrix to the left of this, and therefore p slash prime can be replaced by m, and also p slash can be replaced by m. Therefore this fraction here becomes just m. So we have uh, minus p mu 
plus P prime mu over two times M. So the slashes have become just the mass uh, and with a plus. Thanks. So that looks much better. And also here, the second numerator, the k mu is odd. Therefore, it goes to zero, and only the p's are non-zero. So we have here minus p mu plus p prime mu over two, and the one times minus one over m square. Then the next thing we can look at is the k mu, k nu. What happens to this k mu, k nu term in the numerator? Um, so that is not zero because it is even, and um, it, indeed it is not zero. Uh, but what happens to it? Um, we can use the passerino feldman decomposition. Then it is clear that the integral with uh, such a numerator will be something like g mu nu times uh, b0 with some index, let's call it b20, plus q mu q nu times b21. Why q? Because the denominator only depends on q. So q is the only momentum which can appear here. So therefore, this is the most general result. And uh, therefore, if we have k mu k slash, then we would uh, contract with gamma nu. And then here we have gamma mu times b20 and here we have q mu times q slash b21. And now this here, what can you say about this term? This can be neglected. And what can you say about q slash, which is p prime slash minus p slash? Yes, so p prime slash becomes m, and p slash becomes m, and then we have m minus m gives zero in this case. So that is negligible. Therefore, this term here it entirely drops out, and then only this remains. And then we have the following. Namely, in our numerator, we have absolutely no case anymore. We have simply in the one case, p plus p prime over two times m. In the next case, we have minus p plus p prime over two. In the third case, we have one. But in all cases, we have no k dependence. Therefore, the integral is really the same up to these prefectors. And in the denominator, we have uh, the same as before, times minus one over m square. And now we can shift back our integration momentum if you want. We can shift back by q over two, and then we have one k square and another k plus q square. And then we see that the result is a B zero function with the incoming momentum q. Not q over two, but q. Just shift by q, q over two. So then the result is the following minus one over m square times i over 16 pi square using our notation b0 of q comma m comma m, two times the same small mass and once the incoming momentum q times uh, this combination m times p plus p prime mu over two or uh, minus p plus p prime mu over two or one. That is the result. And in this way, we have calculated three integrals using the soft part of the method of regions. And now we can apply the result of these integrals to both cases for the Higgs diagram and for the Z diagram. Very good. Any questions to the calculation? Yep. Q is P minus P prime, and both P and P prime are small. Therefore, the difference is also small. But we integrate about Q. No, K. K, 
okay is our integration variable. But dealing with the uh, worst case squared minus m squared goes to one, one over capital m squared. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is the approximation that I don't. That is the definition of the soft region in the method of regions. So remember, the method of regions tells us that the loop momentum should be either treated as soft or hard. And when we treat it as soft, then we do a Taylor expansion where the loop momentum is treated as small. That is what we do. And afterwards, we nevertheless integrate over k from zero to infinity. That is the trick of the method of regions. We discussed it uh, once where we had this cut of lambda between the two regions. And then in below lambda, this approximation is correct. Above lambda, it is incorrect. And in the hard region, we do the opposite. But then if we add these incorrect parts of the integrals, then they cancel between soft and hard. That was the rationale behind the method of regions. And in the large mass expansion, it is the same. Yep. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, wouldn't this FM be proportional to B0? Yes. Very good and point. Can we say yes. That this has to be zero? No, we cannot. And uh, remember, and we will discuss this in great detail because that is exactly one of the metrical points of the whole procedure. But um, since uh, now Javier's point is important, so the approximation here is bad uh, if we apply it where k is big. So we have changed the integrand uh, very strongly in the region of uh, large momenta. And therefore, uh, since we changed the integrand in the ultraviolet region, before it was ultraviolet finite, after we have changed the integrand, you see at large k, before it went to zero, now it doesn't go to zero at large k anymore, so we have worsened the ultraviolet behavior. We have made the integral ultraviolet divergent. And that is a fact of life in the method of regions. Before our integral is indeed finite, but uh, the soft part is not finite. It is ultraviolet divergent, and that is a true result. Yes, that is exactly the outcome. It must be like this, otherwise our argument at the time would have been wrong. We stated that these incorrect terms cancel out between each other, and that must, uh, if it works, then it must mean that also the divergences cancel between the two. So we will uh, see that uh, this hard part will have an infrared divergence, which exactly cancels the ultraviolet divergence from here. So we will see all that. That is really an important discussion, and it is not only important because it cancels, but it is important because it gives us additional information which we wouldn't have otherwise. That gives us the information on the logarithms, because now the logs are connected to ln mu square, and therefore to the one over epsilon points. Let us make all of this explicit. Let's, um, I think we have enough time for today to apply this result to the Higgs. Let's apply it to the Higgs and uh, write down exactly for the Higgs boson contribution to G minus two, what is the soft part of the method of regions. So the result for the Higgs, I soft, for the Higgs is now the following. So I copy from the left upper corner over there y square eq times the integral 2 k mu k slash plus 4 m k mu divided uh, by the first two denominator factors times minus 1 over m Higgs square. Okay? So by this I mean take only the first two denominator factors and the third one is replaced by just one over the mass. And here we see again, um, the integral has power counting degree k uh, 
square divided by k to the 4, and we integrate over d 4k, so it is definitely power counting divergent. Really power counting divergent, and before it would have been finite. So, um, and the result? What is the result? Um, for this term, we can copy the result from here. So following our procedure, we have here the gener generic result, k mu k slash in the numerator gives us this result times this prefactor. And uh, the k mu gives us that prefactor. So we have to use this result here times two times that plus four m times that. Okay. Let's write it down. So this is equal to y square e q times i over 16 pi square times minus 1 over m x square times the b0 function of q m m and then times the following 2 times this 2 m p plus p prime mu over 2 plus 4 times the other one minus 4 over 2 p plus uh, m p prime mu. Okay. And then you see here um, 1 m minus 2 m gives overall minus m times p plus p prime. Let's write it down. We have y square e q times m divided by m x square and the minus cancels between this and here and the overall prefactor is 1 um, times i over 16 pi square times the b0 function times p plus p prime you. And maybe just to connect it to the beginning of the lecture, so this would give rise to a contribution to g minus 2 or a mu, a mu x soft. We have now uh, calculated the contribution of the soft part of the x loop to g minus 2. Uh, in order to read off what we need, um, we uh, have to extract the fm, the form factor fm. The form factor is this result up to the p plus p prime and up to minus i e q. So the prefactor minus i e q was not there and p plus p prime was also not there. Um, so this drops out, the i drops out, the p plus p prime drops out. Then we have a minus and we multiply with minus 2m to get g minus 2. So this drops out, that drops out, that drops out, and we multiply by 2m. The 2 cancels the 16 and gives 8, and so then we would say we have, um, let's say, y square divided by 8 pi square. Let's write it like this. y square divided by 8 pi square times m square divided by m x square times b0 of 0 m m because g minus 2 is defined in the limit q square going to 0. So that is the full result for the soft part to the Higgs loop. And here we see the typical structure of loop diagrams coupling square divided by 16 pi square but here by the calculation, we see an additional factor two, so coupling square divided by eight pi square. Then we see the mass suppression, muon mass square divided by Higgs mass square, and a B0 function, which has an ultraviolet divergence, but otherwise also interesting finite contributions. And so we have answered a few questions, namely what is the order in the mass suppression of the result? The order is mass suppression square. Let us, let us um, just write down these discussion points which connect to your question. So we will need to pick them up in the next lecture.
By the way, this Thursday there is lecture, right? Yep. So we will continue with this in the exercise and then also in the lecture on Thursday. But here let's write down some points of discussion. So first of all, it is UV divergent. And why is it UV divergent? As we said, because the method of regions has changed the integrand in the region where the loop momentum is large. It has made the integrand incorrect. You are absolutely right. The integrand is not correct where k is large, but that's just the definition of the soft part. I mean, it's correct for the method of regions, but it deviates from the original integral. That's what I should say, because the integrand was changed at large k. So the UV behavior is worse than originally. So, and uh, in this case, the worse UV behavior has indeed led to an ultraviolet divergence of the full result. But now we see something very important for physics. That is uh, one answer to our initial question, namely on the logarithms. We have now a logarithm in our result because the result is divergent. Every divergence is accompanied by a log. And uh, here the result contains basically one over epsilon plus ln mu square with the same coefficient. And the mu square log must be accompanied by some physical scale. But by which physical scale is it accompanied here? We know it because it's a single scale diagram. And what is the scale that appears in this particular log as a result of that formula? Is it the Higgs mass or the muon mass? It is the muon mass, because that is the argument of the B0 function. So now we know that uh, uh, the soft part contains ln muon mass square with this coefficient. Now we know that the divergence must be cancelled by uh, the hard part. If the method works, that must drop out. The mu square must drop out as well. We said this in the beginning. But this cannot drop out, because just by looking at the structure of the hard part, there can never arise a logarithm of the muon mass. There can only arise a logarithm of the Higgs mass. And therefore, we already know at this point that the full result for g minus 2, including everything hard plus soft, and also the exact calculation, would have to give a logarithm m Higgs squared divided by muon mass squared times this very coefficient. We already know this. And of course, it will be confirmed by the explicit calculation of the hard part. So the Higgs contribution to g minus 2 is mass suppressed, but it is also enhanced by a physical logarithm. Let me not write all uh, this story down. We will uh, comment on it, of course, when we have calculated the hard part. But we see here already um, enough information to puzzle together this important physical statement, but uh, we will do the calculation, of course, and um, then see it explicitly. So what you can do is uh, maybe try for the set diagram. First of all, um, if you want to do the simple thing first, you can just use my result that I claimed for the set numerator. So you see it here at the top. That is the numerator for the set. You can take it plug in the result here for these Feynman diagrams, and then you can extract the soft contribution for the set, and you will discover something very interesting. That is a simple calculation, but very interesting. And of course, the more difficult calculation would be to check uh, and do the explicit computation of the numerator of the set. You can do this in any order you like. You can start with the simple thing, which is interesting, and uh, afterwards do the boring but difficult calculation, which leads to this. And then if you uh, want, you can look at the W uh, on the exercise sheet. 
uh, look at what happens if you apply the method of regions to the W. You will, you will see two diagrams, hard plus soft. Look at them, don't calculate them, and uh, give the answer uh, on the logs. Okay? Then let's meet on Wednesday. Thank you.